Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, just uh, administrative announcement. Um, is anyone has anyone not gotten my emails to the five five one mailing list? Um, if you have not gotten an email to the physics five five one mailing list, that means that. Uh, for some reason, I left you off my email list, so please send me an email, um, and then I can add you uh, to the list. Um, one, uh, physics aside, uh, so last class, I wrote down what I claimed was the most general minimum uncertainty state. Um, you know, it was Gaussian shifted then with this momentum term. Uh, after my lecture, I realized that I, that I was stupid and that there's an obvious way you can generalize that. Uh, to uh, find another minimum uncertainty state that's more general, um, where it's obvious in the sense that it's not actually obvious, but because we're physicists, we say it's obvious. So um, the challenge for all of you is to figure out the most general form for the minimum uncertainty state in uh, for a particle moving in one dimension. Okay, that'll be a fun exercise for you. Um, and I, if you, you don't actually have to do any calculations. Uh, you just have to think carefully about the form for the minimum uncertainty state that I wrote down last time, and think about the sort of symmetries that are relevant for particles in one dimensions. Symmetries on phase space. Okay, um, so that's uh, a, a, an exciting challenge for you, um, in case the first problem set, which I handed out, is not challenging enough. So last uh, week, we uh, completed our discussion of the kinematic postulates of quantum mechanics. Those postulates which involve the description of the space of states and uh, the observables of quantum mechanics. What I wanted to do today was move on uh, from kinematics to dynamics. And to discuss um, the uh, procedure by which we determine how states evolve in time in quantum mechanics. So, um, in particular, this portion of the course will probably last around two weeks. Um, it will involve uh, some degree of review in that I'm assuming you've all seen Schrodinger's equation before. Um, but it will also involve a lot of new stuff in that I'll present um, ways of solving and ways of thinking about quantum dynamics, which are uh, presumably new to at least most of you. Okay, so for example, have any of you seen path integrals? Sometimes it's touched on briefly in undergraduate classes. Um, so we'll give a much more thorough discussion of path integrals here. Has anyone seen a Dyson series or a time-ordered path, a time-ordered uh, exponential? Okay, um, we'll do that today. Uh, has anyone seen um, uh, uh, um, uh, Green's functions for quantum systems? Okay. Um, has anyone seen the Aharon of Bohm effect? Okay, okay. Uh, well, there's going to be a lot of fun stuff then. Um, and also a, a, a little bit of review. So just to set the stage, we spent the last week and a half or so discussing the uh, various kinematic postulates of quantum mechanics. And now we need to add to that an additional postulate which tells us how states evolve in time. And in particular, um, this will be a differential equation which tells us how uh, the ket describing the physical state of a system will evolve in the Hilbert space as a function of time. So this postulate is, uh, can be written in a variety of different ways. The way that you're most familiar with is Schrodinger's equation. So H here is an operator referred to as the Hamiltonian, which is an observable that tells you the energy of the system. And so in particular, we'll be a Hermitian operator. And in general, H could be a function of time. So just out of curiosity, how many of you studied time-dependent Schrodinger equations and time-dependent Hamiltonians? OK, good. Well, that's the first new thing that you're going to learn then, which is that uh, Schrodinger's equation also applies equally well if you have a system where the Hamiltonian depends explicitly on time. 
Now, you're used to systems, uh, you know, a lot of elementary mechanical systems have a uh, time translation symmetry, and hence the Hamiltonian and the energy will not depend explicitly on time, so the energy will be conserved. But of course, there are also many systems that one could consider where the Hamiltonian has some explicit time dependence. So, uh, for example, if you only want to consider uh, some subset of a system so that while total energy is conserved, energy could interchange between uh, this subset of the system and the outside world, then the effective Hamiltonian that describes that will depend on time. So, for example, if you wish to, to describe uh, friction, okay, then even though actually in the real world we know that energy is conserved, uh, from the point, from an effective point of view, it would be useful to describe that in terms of a Hamiltonian that contains some time dependence. Um, or, for example, if you have a uh, harmonic oscillator whose frequency depends on time, whose spring constant depends on time, then uh, you would describe that by a Hamiltonian, where the frequency uh, in uh, that system will depend on time. Um, and that identical Hamiltonian is useful not just for springs which, whose uh, spring constant depends on time, but, for example, to uh, the early universe, where the size of the universe would depend on time in some very rapid way. So if you wish to describe the quantum mechanics of uh, particles in the early universe, uh, then effectively uh, one of the spring constants, uh, or one of the constants that appears, which plays the same role as the spring constant, will depend on time. So... Um, Time-dependent Hamiltonians appear all over the place, and we'll need to know how to solve Schrodinger's equation uh, in those circumstances. So, um, an alternate way of describing this postulate is uh, not to write down Schrodinger's equation, but to simply say that if psi of t is the state of the system at time t, then um, that state of the system at time t is related to the state of the system at time t prime by the action of some linear operator u. So, uh, so Schrodinger's equation, uh, psi dot is equal to the Hamiltonian acting on psi, is a linear differential equation. So that means if you wish to relate the state at some later time to the state at some earlier time, then it, they'll be related by the action of some linear operator, which I have called u here. And um, in fact, uh, it's easy to show that this operator u, which is referred to as the time evolution operator, must be a unitary operator. So how uh, can we see that this operator is unitary? So let's first just assume that the state at time t is normalized so that, for example, if the you wanted to compute the probability of some observable A, as a function of time in the state psi, then that would just be equal to the norm of the eigen the eigen uh, vector a contracted with psi, sorry, interproducted with psi, um, absolute value squared. And then um, the statement uh, that. Uh, the sum of all probabilities of some observable summed over all possible eigenvalues has to be equal to 1 is just a consequence of the fact that the state is unit normalized. So if you wanted to see that uh, very explicitly, you could compute the sum over A of P, a of P of A. So what is that? That's the sum over A of psi of T A a psi of t, so just writing out explicitly that absolute value, then we use the fact that the sum over all A of this projection operator is equal to 1. So this is nothing more and nothing less than 
the norm of the wave function. So the statement that our wave function is unit normalized is related to the fact that the sum of all probabilities has to equal one. So that's a basic statement that any dynamical system should obey. And so then you could ask what property does U have to have in order to maintain this uh, normalization property of the wave function. So um, if psi of t is the time evolution operator acting on psi of t prime, then you could go ahead and compute the norm of psi of t and compare it to the norm of psi of t prime. So ask how the norm changes as a function of time uh, according to this equation. Well, by definition, the bra associated with um, psi t will be the bra associated with psi t prime times uh, u dagger. That's the definition of uh, the adjoint or the Hermitian conjugate. So if you wish to demand that the state remains unit normalized at all time, we could just go ahead and plug in this equation. And set this equal to 1. And then we'll see that if the state is unit normalized at all time, then U must be a unitary operator. And likewise, one can also show that because U dagger U is equal to 1, U times U dagger is also equal to 1. So um, this statement that uh, U is unitary is sometimes called in grandiose terms the conservation of probability. Um, that's a little grandiose uh, since really all we're doing is demanding that our time evolution operator take unit normalized states into unit normalized states. One could, of course, also consider a time evolution operator that, you know, rescales uh, the norm of the wave function as a function of time. Uh, because the norm of the wave function is not observable, uh, that uh, won't have any observable consequences. So you could view this uh, constraint of unitarity as in part just coming from the convention that we wish to always work with unit normalized states. There will certainly be some times when it might be convenient to work with non-normalizable states, in which case you would have to reconsider this logic a little bit. Okay, so what other properties does this unitary time evolution operator have? Well, if you take the unitary time evolution operator, which evolves you from time t1 to t2, and multiply it by the evolution operator from t1, t2 to t3, then that should be equal to the time evolution operator that takes you the whole way from t1 to t3. Moreover, the time evolution operator that doesn't do anything shouldn't do anything. So if you don't evolve at any time at all, then this operator should be equal to 1. Of course, one could also uh, use some perverse convention where it's equal to a phase because phases don't change anything. Um, but this is the, certainly the simplest convention that one could adopt for the time evolution operator. And actually, if you take these two conditions and you put them together, it's easy enough to, con to see that the unitary time evolution operator that takes you from T1 to T2 is the inverse of the one that goes backwards from T2 to T1. So, which, of course, is also the adjoint, because for a unitary operator, the inverse of the operator is equal to the adjoint just because of this definition. So um, what is the relationship between the time evolution operator and the Hamiltonian? Well, remember the Hamiltonian is defined by the statement that the derivative of the state vector is the Hamiltonian acting on the state vector. So if you just take this formula for the time evolution of a state, 
then we should be able to take the derivative of this equation and compare it to Schrodinger's equation and obtain a relationship between the unitary time evolution operator and the Hamiltonian. Let's go ahead and do that. So you just take the derivative of both sides with respect to T, remembering that uh, as physicists, uh, the definition of a Hilbert space is that it's a vector space where you can do take derivatives. So uh, everything is kosher here. So what is that? Well, that's the time derivative of U with respect to T. So I'll just call that U dot times psi at T prime. And we wish to write down a uh, differential equation uh, for the state vector psi at time T. So I'll need to use the fact that uh, I can relate psi of t to psi of t prime, again, by the action of this unitary operator. Uh, so we just do the operator that evolves backwards from t prime to t, acting on psi of t. And we obtain a differential equation for the state vector psi at time t. Or I could write this uh, using this relationship up above as u dot t of t prime, u dagger t of t prime, acting on psi of t. So um, this statement that time evolution is generated by a unitary operator is equivalent to Schrodinger's equation. Um, and in particular, it gives you some first order differential equation for psi of t. So it's useful just to compare this to the Schrodinger equation which is that I H bar D by D T uh, acting on psi is the Hamiltonian acting on psi. So uh, you can see that the Hamiltonian then is um, I H bar times U dot U dagger. So it's worth uh, just checking this a little bit. So remember that the Hamiltonian is supposed to be a Hermitian operator, and U is a unitary operator. So the first thing that you should ask is whether uh, U dot U dagger is a Hermitian operator. Uh, has, it, does ever, has everyone uh, seen? OK, maybe you haven't seen the proof that if you take the time derivative of a unitary operator uh, and multiply it by U dagger, you get a Hermitian operator. Um, it's a, a sort of cute proof uh, that takes about 30 seconds. Um, so I'll just show it to you. So if U is a unitary operator, what does that mean? That means that U times U dagger is equal to 1. So let's take the time derivative of that equation. So what is the time derivative? It's U dot U dagger plus U times U dot dagger which is equal to zero because the time derivative of one is equal to zero. So what is that? That is u dot u dagger plus the adjoint of u dot u dagger. Just using the fact that when you take the dagger, you need to reverse the order of the operators and apply the dagger to each one. So what is this equation? This means that u dot times u dagger is anti-Hermitian so that taking its adjoint will flip its sign so that if you multiplied it by I you would obtain a Hermitian operator because the adjoint involves a complex conjugation which will flip the sign uh, of I. Okay, so um, our equation then which relates the time evolution operator to the Hamiltonian is I H bar times U dot U dagger, uh, sorry, is equal to the Hamiltonian. Or if we wanted to rewrite that, we could write it as I H bar U dot is equal to H times U. So in general, 
if you want to solve Schrodinger's equation, so we've written down Schrodinger's equation, but if you want to solve Schrodinger's equation, then that's equivalent to solving this differential equation in the box here, which determines the unitary time evolution operator at finite time in terms of the Hamiltonian. So sometimes uh, we'll say that uh, the Hamiltonian generates an infinitesimal uh, time evolution because it tells you the di differential equation obeyed by the wave function. And the U describes the finite time evolution. So if you wish to solve Schrodinger's equation, then that's equivalent to solving this operator differential equation right here. So let's go ahead and solve it. Any questions before I do so? So let's solve this equation. <laughs> of course, what I'm going to present now is um, a bit of a formal solution, of course, because I'm not going to tell you yet that we're studying a specific Hamiltonian on a specific Hilbert space. Um, but I think it's still a very useful thing to do. So uh, let's go ahead and solve this equation. Remember that the Hamiltonian could be a function of time. So um, this is some operator differential equation, or if you like, you could think of it as a matrix differential equation, because you can always think of these operators U and H as matrices. And it's a matrix differential equation, which involves this matrix or operator H here that has some explicit time dependence. So before trying to write down the most general solution to this equation, Let's just consider first the simple case where H is time independent. So in that case, um, we're solving the equation I H bar U dot is equal to some constant matrix times U. So before trying to uh, write down this equation for uh, matrices, Let's just imagine that H and U were numbers rather than matrices and ask how we would solve this equation. Well, in that case, you know very well how to solve that equation. So if H and U were numbers instead of operators, and so in particular, they all commuted with one another, then the solution to this equation would be U is equal to e to the minus i h t divided by h bar. So let's just check. You take the time derivative, then that's just the same as pulling down a factor of minus i h over t, so that i h times u dot would be equal to h times u. So in order to generalize this to matrices, we need to come up with some notion of an exponential of a matrix. So for some operator or matrix, we define the exponential of that matrix in the same way that we define the exponential of a number, namely via the Taylor expansion. So if we're lucky, and we will usually be lucky, this Taylor expansion will be convergent and this will provide a definition of what we mean by the exponential of an operator. And then uh, if this is, if the Hamiltonian is time dependent, then uh, all of the considerations uh, that we described above for the case where H and U were numbers will continue to work uh, once H and U are operators. So that U equals E to the minus I H T over H bar is the solution uh, when U and H are operators. So um, we could go ahead and check that if you like. Um, the check is easy. We just um, to plug in the definition of the exponential and take the derivative, so then u dot will be the sum 
So the n equals zero term is a constant, so it, it disappears when you take the derivative. So it's the sum of n equals one to infinity of one over n factorial times the derivative of the guy in parentheses. So what is that? That's minus i over h bar times h times minus i t over h bar h to the n minus one power times an overall n out front because you're taking the derivative of something to the nth power. Which, let's just pull this factor in the parentheses out front, is minus one over h bar h times uh, the sum from n equals one to infinity. And then if you think about it, you can, you can check that if you relabel n uh, by one, so if you define m as n minus one, then this is the sum over m equals zero to infinity of one over m factorial because the n here canceled uh, one of the n's downstairs of minus i t over h bar times h to the mth power, which of course gives us the desired differential equation. Okay, so uh, I assume that you guys have seen at some point this expression for the time evolution operator in terms of h. Is that correct? Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, well, you've seen it now. Um, it's just, uh, it's a, so when the Hamiltonian is uh, time independent, the solution for this unitary operator is um, formally quite simple to write down. Uh, now, in general, of course, uh, if I handed you a specific Hamiltonian of a specific system, uh, actually computing the exponential may or may not be an easy thing to do. Uh, so, for example, for a spin one half system where they're all two by two matrices, uh, this is often a, something one can do explicitly. But if you have a one dimensional particle where the Hamiltonian is some complicated uh, operator that depends on some horrifying potential, then it may or may not be an easy thing to do to evaluate this explicitly. I should point out one uh, important feature of this expression, which we will be exploiting which is that this power series for u is also an expansion in powers of one over h bar. Okay, so if you wish to consider the limit where h bar um, is, uh, actually no, let me hold off on, on that discussion. Um, it'll make more sense for me to give that discussion when the time comes, but expressions like this are very often useful when um, considering uh, the classical limit where h bar is sent very small to be very small, uh, it, where one can then derive approximations to the Schrodinger equation um, as a perturb uh, as a perturbative series in powers of h bar. Okay. So that's something that we'll do when we discuss the WKB approximation. By the way, how many of you have seen the WKB approximation? You have. That's fantastic. They don't always teach it in the undergraduate class here, which. I complained enough about it that I think they finally started teaching it. Okay, good. Now let's consider the interesting case. What happens if the Hamiltonian depends on time? So what if H is a function of time? Well, then uh, this does not work. So let's just, again, um, as a little bit of inspiration, consider the case where u and h are numbers. So if u and h were numbers instead of operators, and you were trying to solve the equation u dot is equal to h of t times u, how would you solve it? Well, uh, this is... So um, this is something uh, which you may or may not have seen. Um, let's write it this way. In a class on differential equations. So um, we want our answer to involve uh, an exponential, because clearly exponentials are the right kind of beasts to consider for this equation. And we want it to be some sort of generalization of this boxed equation, which was the exponential of h times t. So what sort of proper generalization could we make of h times t if h is a function of time? Well, h times t is also the integral of h over t. So a natural thing to guess 
<coughs> is that this unitary operator would be the integral from t naught up to t h of t times uh, h of uh, let's call it t prime times dt prime. Okay. Um, and then, uh, if we wanted to be explicit, this is defined via the power series expansion. So this is integral of t naught up to t, h of t prime, dt prime, to the nth power. And then um, you can add, you can check that if u and h are just numbers instead of operators. Well, when you take the time derivative, so if you take the derivative with respect to t you get the sum over n, 1 over n factorial. And then you need to take the time derivative of the quantity in the expression. Well, what is the time derivative of an integral? That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. So you just get h of t. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have included some powers of i and h bar and stuff like that. Oh, I guess uh, I left them out of this equation. So I don't need to include them. Okay, good. Well, there's some obvious powers of i and h bar. Um, so, uh, if you um, take the derivative of an integral, uh, you get the value of the function being integrated. So, you get h of t times the integral t naught up to t, h of t prime, dt prime, to the nth power, to the n minus 1th power. And uh, by the same argument that we gave before, you just relabel the indices. This is h times u. Oh, and there was an n up front because we we're taking the derivative of this integral to the nth power. Okay. So if h and u were numbers, this is the solution to the differential equation. So let's now ask under what circumstances this uh, solution will continue to be correct if h and u are operators. So in the case where h was time independent, we found that the, the solution didn't depend, you know, the solution was the same independent of whether h and u were numbers or whether they were operators. Here, however, we see that something a little trickier is going on. Because when I write down h of times u, so this is h of t times u, h will have some explicit time dependence. And it always appears to the left of the stuff that you're integrating over here. However, um, when you take the exponential, um, so when I wrote down this expression using the fact that h and u were numbers, I was implicitly using the fact that I numbers commute with one another, and I could always move h of t to the left. And so indeed, so the simple case would be if we can continue to make that assumption so that namely if h of t commutes with h of t prime, then this continues to be the correct answer. So u of t and t naught will be the exponential of minus i over h bar times the integral t naught up to t dt prime h of t prime. In particular, if h of t commutes with h of t prime for all t and t prime, then um, we could treat these guys just like numbers. And any argument that works for numbers will work for these operators. Because when we manipulate numbers, we assume that numbers commute with one another. OK. But now here's the interesting case. So what happens? if h of t does not commute with h of t prime. This will be the generic situation. So you'd have to be pretty damn lucky for h to commute with itself at different times. Now, of course, uh, an operator commutes with itself, but if h is a function of time, then h of t is not necessarily equal to h of t prime. And so it would have to be some sort of special circumstance in order for those two operators to commute. 
So if you just want to think about an example in your head, you could imagine our harmonic, harmonic oscillator whose frequency depends on time. Then the Hamiltonian is, H, is p squared plus something times x squared, where the coefficient of x squared is the function of time. And so then you can see that the Hamiltonian at one time will not commute with the Hamiltonian at another time because x squared and p squared don't commute. So this will be the generic case. Okay, so what would happen if we tried to use this solution up here to solve our equation? So just to make life simpler, I'm going to forget about our factors of i and h bar for a minute, just because they'll make our equations a bit more complicated. So if u is the exponential of the integral from t naught up to t, dt prime, h of t prime, then u dot... So, so that, so let's just write this out explicitly in terms of a Taylor expansion. Well, so that'll be the sum of the integral to the nth power. So that's the sum over n, 1 over n factorial, integral t naught up to t, dt prime, h of t prime, to the nth power. So that's 1 plus the integral t naught up to t, dt prime, h of t prime, plus the in one half times the integral squared. So let me write that second term out a little bit more explicitly. So plus one half times the integral t naught up to t, dt prime, times h of t prime. And then if we wanted to be a little slick, we could write the second integral as an integral over another variable. Let's call it dt double prime times h of t double prime uh, plus subsequent terms. Okay, so now let's compute u dot. So the derivative of 1 is equal to 0. Okay, so that one's easy. And the derivative of this term up here is just h of t by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So now let's compute the time derivative of this second term. And it's for terms of this sort that you'll see exactly why it is that the exponential of the integral is not a solution of the equation. So there are two places where time appears here. So uh, Time appears as the argument of one integral and as the argument as the boundary of another integral. So we need to add them together. So what do we get? We get one half times h of t times the integral over dt double prime. h of t double prime. And then there's the second case where we get the integral over t prime, h of t prime, times h of t. Everyone with me so far? And what we wish to do is compare this to h of t times u. So what we wish to do is ask whether this is equal to h of t times u. So what is h of t times u? Well, u had the expansion where it was equal to 1. So the first term in that expansion is h of t. Okay, so the first term here matches the first term here. So that's all well and good. But then the second term will be h of t times the integral t naught up to t prime, up to t, d t prime, h of t prime, plus dot, dot, dot. So the question is whether that quantity in brackets up here equals the quantity down there. And if you stare at it for a second, you'll see that the answer is no. So that first term up here is okay, because... Uh, dt double prime is just something I'm integrating over. It's just the name I'm giving to a variable I'm integrating over. So if I wanted to, I could get rid of those double primes and call them primes, right? That's just the name for some integration variable. 
So you can see that that first term is precisely what I have down here. But the second term is not. Why? Because in the second term, h of t appears to the right rather than to the left of the integral. Now, if h of t commuted with h of t prime, then we could just move it to the other side and everything would agree. And so that's why if uh, we're lucky enough that h commutes with itself at all times, that then we could go ahead and use this simple expression. But now we need to ask um, what happens if h of t does not commute with itself. So the commutator of h of t with the operator that we obtain by integrating is non-zero. Okay. So the problem is clear to everyone. So let's now uh, see if we can figure out what the solution is. So let's go ahead and rewrite this quantity in parentheses here a little bit. Or sorry. So let's go ahead and consider this quantity over here, which is the second order term of this expansion, where we first discovered this problem. So let's just write that term down again. So that term was 1 half integral of t naught up to t dt prime times the integral of t naught up to t dt double prime of h of t prime times h of t double prime. Now, I could rewrite this term in a very slick way if I wanted to. Because I could divide the range of integration of t double prime into two parts. I could divide it into a part where t double prime is less than t prime and a part where t double prime is greater than t prime. So if I wanted to write down the first of those, it would look like this. So t naught up to t prime times h of t prime, h of t double prime. And then the second term would be where t naught is greater than, where t naught double prime is greater than t prime. And for that term, I could just relabel my, int my integration variables, replacing t prime and t double prime. And all you would get is the same expression, but with uh, the order of h of t prime and h of t double prime reversed. So in particular, um, this integral can be divided into two different pieces. So what is this integral? This is a double integral that we're doing. And there are two different cases. One case where t prime is bigger than t double prime, and the other case where t prime is less than t double prime. And so all I've done here is written down a slick way of uh, encapsulating that fact. And you can see that these two different cases are precisely uh, the two different cases, one of which worked and one of which didn't work when we tried to use this exponential to solve our differential equations. And even more generally, you could write 1 over n factorial times the integral of t naught up to t dt prime h of t prime to the nth power as 1 over n factorial times the integral of t naught up to t dt prime, integral of t naught up to uh, t prime dt double prime, and so forth, up until some nth integral, I don't know what we should call it, dt sub uh, n up to t n minus 1. And what are you integrating? You're integrating h of t prime times h of t double prime all the way up to h of t n plus the various symmetric combinations. 
So plus the one where we, so plus all symmetric permutations of T and T prime and T double prime, T triple prime and so forth. So what have I done here? I've rewritten the term in the expansion so that the only place that T ever appears is in this very first integral. So why have I done that? I've done that because part of the problem that we encountered above was that T appeared as the range of integration of all sorts of different uh, integrals. Now I've just rewritten this integral so that T only appears in the first integral, in the first one. Okay, so now I think it should be clear how it is we can solve our problem and obtain a solution to the differential equation. Because what we want is we want that when you multiply, when you take the time derivative, so if we want to get u dot equal to h of t acting on u, then we need to get h of t acting on the left. Whereas, as you can see from this expression here, when you take the derivative of this guy with respect to t, that just corresponds to setting t prime equals to t in this expression here. And you'll get this first term where the h of t prime is all the way on the left. That'll give you h of t. But the various other symmetric combinations will give you places where h of t sits somewhere in the middle of a bunch of h of t primes. And those are the terms that we don't want. So to get u dot equals h of t times u, all we need to do is reorder the terms in the parentheses, so these terms here, such that h of t prime is always on the left. If you wanted to think about it, uh, the reason why you need to do this is that the differential equation that we're writing down says that u dot is equal to h times u, where we multiply h times u on the left. Whereas the exponential operation is completely democratic. It gives you all possible orderings of h. When you, so if you exponentiate h, gives you all possible orderings. Now, if h commuted with itself, if h was in, because h was de independent of time, then that's something that we didn't care about. But once h depends on time, this effect is important. Okay. So, let's go ahead and write down the solution. So the solution then, Um, will be the sum over n of this quantity up here where I reorder everything so that everything uh, we ha is uh, time ordered. Okay, so that lower times take place on the left and greater times take place on the right. So it'll be this integral t naught up to t dt prime, the integral of t naught up to t prime dt double prime, and so forth, up to the integral of dt n, t n minus 1. And what will we integrate? Well, we'll just integrate this first term, forgetting about all of its symmetric cousins. So h of t prime, h of t double prime, all the way up to h of t n. Now, um, I've been very careful to not write a 1 over n factorial here. Why have I not written the 1 over n factorial? Well, the number of symmetric permutations of n objects is n factorial. So in order to get everything to work out, I need to both, if I'm going to drop all of these symmetric uh, permutations, I also need to drop that n factorial. Another way of saying that is that the n factorial is now taken into account by the fact that I have restricted the volume of integration here to some very small region 
whose volume was only 1 over n factorial times the initial volume. So initially I integrated all of the t's from t, t, all of the t primes from t0 up to t. So that gave me a volume which went like, uh, you know, uh, t minus t naught to the nth power. Here now I'm integrating over some very, very small <coughs> portion of that region whose volume, if you think about it, is exactly equal to 1 over n factorial. In the same way that the volume of a square with unit sides is equal to 1, the volume of a uh, triangle, so the volume of a triangle with unit sides is half that, whereas the volume of a cube with unit sides would be equal to 1, whereas the volume of, uh, you know, whatever sort of pyramid you get that I won't quite be able to draw, where you take three of these points here and you draw the plane connecting them and you cut the cube down the middle. So the volume of that guy, how do I draw, how do you draw that? There we go. The volume of that guy is equal to one sixth, also known as one over three factorial, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's go ahead and give a name to this object. So it's very close to the exponential, except we have ordered the uh, operators that appear when you exponentiate in a particular way. Um, so this is usually referred to as the time-ordered or the path-ordered exponential. And, okay, let me now be honest and restore all those factors of i and h bar that I've been scrupulously neglecting. So um, this symbol p refers to the fact that this is a so-called path ordered or time ordered exponential. So it's path ordered because if you view uh, the Hamiltonian, t if you view, uh, well, if you want to view this in a more general setting and apply it not just to quantum mechanics, then you could imagine that you have some path that you need to integrate along and you just order the operator uh, so that they're always an increasing order along the path. And this then is the most general solution to the Schrodinger equation. Um, this expression um, for the path-ordered exponential has another name. It's referred to as the Dyson series because it was also used by Freeman Dyson uh, in his discussions of particle physics. So why might this be useful in particle physics? Well, let's imagine that you have a, a big Hamiltonian and a very small piece of the Hamiltonian. Then one, so uh, you could have a big Hamil, uh, sort of one piece of the Hamiltonian that you might be able to solve, say some harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, and then another piece of the Hamiltonian that you couldn't solve, which you uh, might be some very complicated other piece of the potential. Then if you want to understand how to perturbatively describe solutions to this, to Schrodinger's equation, you could imagine turning off uh, this small perturbative piece, gradually turning it on as a function of time, and then turning it off again. And so then that would mean that you're effectively describing a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And this uh, equation that I've written down is an efficient way of writing down the solutions of these time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equations in a perturbative series. Um, we'll probably do a little bit of uh, time-dependent perturbation theory later on in this course, um, which will, and the starting point for time-dependent perturbation theory will be uh, this expression for the path-ordered or time-ordered exponential, uh, also known as the Dyson series. Any questions?
People often uh, get confused the first time that they see a path ordered exponential because the proof that I gave is a little bit technical. Um, it's actually really rather simple, so I encourage you to go through it again on your own if everything was not clear. Uh, it's also worth emphasizing that the path ordered exponential is not just something that appears in uh, quantum mechanics. In fact, it's a very general mathematical object that will appear all over the place in physics, in mathematics, uh, in all sorts of areas. Anytime you have a system of linear differential equations you want to solve where the coefficients depend on time or depend on whatever parameter, the solution is a path ordered differential equation, is a path ordered exponential. So uh, it's a basic little uh, uh, tool that should fit in your mathematical toolbox uh, if you want to solve any sort of differential equation. Um, for those of you who uh, are studying uh, some particle physics or uh, general relativity or um, geometry, uh, this path ordered exponential has another name. It's sometimes referred to as the holonomy. Uh, so I don't know if that word means much to anyone, but if you study, uh, um, um, but if you study, for example, geometry, then it's a useful way of uh, characterizing uh, certain geometries. Okay. So um, let me now uh, tell you, remind you of something that you probably already do know. So let's return to the case where H is independent of time. In that case, in order to explicitly write out the solutions of Schrodinger's equation, it's useful to um, use the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So the eigenstates will be denoted En. And then if you wish to solve the uh, Schrodinger equation, we just need to write the uh, initial wave function at, say, some time t equals zero in terms of uh, this basis of eigenstates. So this will be a sum over n, en, psi of zero times en. And then psi of t will be e to the minus i h t over h bar acting on psi of zero. And so we can then just go ahead and plug in our equation for the energy of these eigenstates and we get the sum over n en psi zero times e to the minus i en t over h bar times en. Again, using the fact that one is the sum of all the projection operators onto the energy eigenstates. Sorry, that, that's an n there. It's not a very pretty one, but it is. And again, I'm using the fact that H acting on one of these eigenstates is equal to E acting on one of these eigenstates. And then I'm just exponentiating it. So these energy eigenstates are sometimes referred to as stationary states. Because as you can see from this equation, if psi starts out proportional to one of the energy eigenstates, it will remain proportional to that eigenstate, possibly multiplied times a phase, which depends on time. That phase in and of itself is, of course, unobservable. But if you wish to compare two of these uh, states, for example, by performing some interference experiment, that phase, or at least some combination of those phases, will be observable. I'm implicitly assuming here, of course, that H has a, a non-degenerate spectrum. If you have two energy eigenstates which coincide, then you will need to do something else. You will need to uh, do something in addition. Namely, you'll need to find an orthonormal basis of these energy eigenstates, 
uh, even within this uh, degenerate subspace. Questions? So that presumably is something that you have all seen before. So uh, let's move on. Any questions? Let me pause. On. I haven't been getting enough questions. I'm very disappointed in all of you. I'm not going to say anything until someone asks a question. I can wait all day. Nobody is going to ask a question. I'm not going to go on until somebody asks, asks a question. I can wait a long time. Okay, ask a question. You're sitting right in front of me. <laughs> Don't look at me. Fine. Oh, good question. Um, is there a case where you would use a time dependent on the element even though the system is not Um There are cases where, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, there are cases where it may be useful to think of a system as time dependent even if overall energy is conserved. So um, I briefly mentioned uh, uh, the use of this Dyson series in quantum perturbation theory. Um, so, uh, for example, um, let's be a little more explicit. Let's say I've got a nucleus here, okay, and I want to scatter something off of it, okay. Um, energy is conserved. The Hamiltonian describing this nucleus, say it's the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, and I want to scatter uh, an electron off of it. Um, then, um, of course, the Hamiltonian is constant. It's just the Hamiltonian of this. Uh, of this um, hydrogen atom, um, but it might be useful to think of the electron as it whizzes by this uh, hydrogen nucleus as having a time-dependent Hamiltonian. From the point of view of the electron, uh, if you're very far away from the nucleus, you don't feel anything. As you whiz by, it's a little like you have an interaction which turns on and then turns off again. So that is effectively a time-dependent Hamiltonian. So you will often see, um, I don't know how many of you are taking the particle physics class, but you'll often see uh, these Dyson series and these path-ordered uh, exponentials arising, not just for time-dependent Hamiltonians, but for any computation and scattering theory. You guys may or may not have seen a little scattering theory, at least elementary scattering theory, um, but um, these Dyson series are very useful tools for um, developing perturbative approximations to uh, scattering coefficients, for example. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, fine. One question, I guess, is all I can ask. Okay. So what I would now like to discuss is a mild but completely equivalent reformulation of the dynamical equations of quantum mechanics. So, so far... We have viewed the state psi of t as time dependent, but the observables A say as time independent. And um, this is perfectly consistent, so we take A of at some initial time zero to evolve to some a of t, which is equal to a of zero, whereas psi will evolve to some psi of t, which is not equal to a, psi of zero. So um, this is uh, perfectly uh, consistent, but it's a little at odds with the way that we think about classical physics. So in classical physics, things like position and momenta are observables, which change in time. So you could ask whether there's a formulation of the uh, equations of motion where we can think about observables themselves depending on time. So this um, picture where the observables are time independent is referred to as the Schrodinger picture. But I could just as well uh, work in what is known as the Heisenberg picture. Where you 
take your observables to evolve in some way as a function of time, but the state will not evolve in time. So how must our observables evolve in time Well, the answer is that the uh, observables have to evolve uh, uh, by conjugation by this time evolution operator. So there are a variety of ways of seeing that this is the only possible way that these uh, observables can uh, evolve consistent with uh, the dy quantum dynamics postulate that we began this lecture with. So, for example, if you compare the Schrodinger picture equations to the Heisenberg picture equations, then you'll see that even though what is evolving is different in these two pictures, the outcome of any measurement must be the same. So, the outcomes of measurements... are the same. So, for example, if you were to compute the expectation value of A, say, in the Schrodinger picture, then what is that, that psi u dagger A psi, which, of course, is equal to the expectation value of A in the Heisenberg picture? It's just that in one picture, you attribute that time evolution to the evolution of the state and in the other picture, you attribute that time evolution to the evolution of the operator. So the important fact is that whenever you're computing an observable quantity, you always have one bra on the left and one ket on the right. So you always have some collection of operators which are being multiplied by u dagger on the right and on the left and u, and u on the right. I'm assuming that you all have seen the Heisenberg picture before. Have you not seen the Heisenberg picture? Well, you've seen it now. Okay. Um, wow. You learn something new every day. Okay. Um, so um, I encourage you then uh, to spend a little bit of time uh, thinking about this Heisenberg picture because it's a formulation of quantum dynamics that is uh, much more um, in line with a lot of the ways that we think about classical physics. Yes, there's a question. Sorry, could you just explain the second line? The yes, line? good. Okay. Sorry, this line here? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so in the Schrodinger picture, our observables are constant and our um, uh, state evolves in time. In the Heisenberg picture, the observables evolve in time, but the state is unchanged. Now, in classical physics, both the observables and the state evolve at the same time, there's not really a distinction in classical physics between the observables and the description of the state. But in quantum mechanics, we make a precise distinction between the two. And to describe time evolution, you can say you could you could work using either one. Good question. Another question? Um, yes. So it is often uh, useful to both evolve the state and the operator at the same time. So, um, for example, let's say that you want to divide the Hamiltonian into two pieces, one of which you know how to solve exactly, the other of which you don't. And you wish to um, use some perturbative, perturbative mechanism to study the one that you don't. It will often be useful to use, uh, say, Schrodinger picture for one of the Hamiltonians and Heisenberg picture for the other. So this gives you what is known as uh, the interaction picture. Yeah, so you'll use one, uh, you'll describe the evolution with respect to one Hamiltonian using the Schrodinger picture and the other Hamiltonian using the Heisenberg picture. But it would be incorrect to describe uh, the time evolution with both of them using the same Hamilton. Uh, it would be incorrect to evolve both the... Um, uh, observables and the states according to this law uh, at the same time. 
as you could check, for example, the outcomes of measurements would change. Okay. So let me give you one example of the utility of the Heisenberg picture. So first, let's work out what the equations of motion are in the Heisenberg picture. And then uh, you'll see immediately why um, it's so lovely. In some senses, it's a more elegant formulation of the laws of quantum mechanics than the Schrodinger picture. But trying to say that something is more elegant than the other is not a useful way of spending your time. Okay, so in the Schrodinger picture, we just wrote down a differential equation for psi as a function of t. In the Heisenberg picture, psi is unchanged. So it doesn't obey uh, any interesting differential equation other than saying that it's equal to a constant. What about A? So A of t is equal to u dagger times A of 0 times u of t. Of course, uh, I could use a different time aside from 0 here. I'm just setting the initial time equals to 0. Um, for convenience. You could always use some t prime, for example. So then a dot is equal to u dot dagger times a of 0 times u plus u dagger times a times u dot. Just because time appears two places in this equation, once in the u dagger and once in the u. So this is the expression for a dot at time equal at time t. And if we wish to write down a differential equation for a dot, then we need to re replace these a of zeros by a of t. And we're going to do that by using this equation here. So this then is equal to u dot dagger times u a of t u dagger. Right, because if a of t is equal to u dagger a u, um, then a of 0 is equal to u a of t u dagger, just using the fact that u inverse is equal to u dagger, so times u, so I'm just inserting that here, then plus the same equation u dagger u a of t, sorry, let me write that line below, plus u dagger times u a of t, u, uh, u dagger times u dot. So we can now simplify this a little bit. So u times u dagger is equal to 1. u times u dagger is equal to 1. What is this? This is u dot dagger u times a of t plus a of t times u dagger u dot. I hope that you remember that we had a special name for the operator uh, u dagger times u dot. So u dot times u dagger is uh, the operator is the Hamiltonian operator divided by i h bar. And uh, so that is the, yeah. And likewise, uh, that is minus u dot dagger u, uh, simply using the fact that h is a Hermitian operator and uh, u dot dagger u is anti-Hermitian. So that means that a of t, the time derivative, is minus 1 over i h bar times h a plus a times h. Uh, sorry, let's get our signs right. So we need to take the dagger of this guy, which give you the dagger of this guy. Did I... Have I made a sign mistake somewhere here? 
Sorry, I just want to make sure that this is one of those few cases where I'm going to actually be careful about a sign. I just want to, let's, okay. So indeed, uh, if you take the Hermitian conjugate, ah, okay. It's also the case that this is minus u u dot dagger okay we need to be a little careful so what was it so u dagger u is equal to one so that u dot dagger u is anti-hermitian and was equal to uh, h over i h bar and the same argument will say that u times, uh, so u dagger times u dot. So all you need to do is take the, is use that equation again with u times u dagger instead of u dagger times u. Then this is also anti-Hermitian. And um, for similar reasons, it will have to be equal to um, minus h over i h bar. No, plus h, uh, yeah, it's going to be plus h over i h bar. Right. So this will be um, 1 over i h bar times h a. Good. Uh, a h, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so let's, what is this? This is a dot is 1 over i h bar times the commutator of a with h. Yes, question. Yeah. Um, well, when you, t if, so I, I was just using the fact that, yes, I'm using uh, this equation here. I'm using this formula here. Oh, okay, because there's a minus sign there, that's why. Yeah, right, sorry about that. Yeah, okay, uh, I'm usually not very careful about the minus signs, but this is an equation where the minus signs are important, because if you get them wrong, you'll get an anti-commutator instead of a commutator. And why did I want to get a commutator here? Well, the reason why I wanted to get a commutator, so this is the basic equation of motion of quantum mechanics in the Heisenberg picture. So this is the Heisenberg form of the equations of motion. And so let's compare that to classical physics. So in classical physics, you can write down the equation of motion not in Lagrangian form, but in Hamiltonian form. So if you have some observable A whose time derivative you wish to compute, well, that is just the Poisson bracket of A with H. And so remember that, loosely speaking, our, quantiza our quantization rule is that Poisson brackets go to 1 over ih bar times commutators. So that this is consistent with our quantization rule, which states that classical Poisson brackets are replaced by commutators times 1 over i h bar. You know, uh, yes, question. I don't actually remember, is there a um, Yeah, okay. I guess this equation that as I have written it down um, will involve a uh, 
Well, okay. Uh, this is true uh, for time uh, independent Hamiltonians. Actually, no. Uh, if there were partial derivatives there, it would be true for time independent Hamiltonians. Right? No, okay, sorry. There's plus a dh by dt term. That's right. So this is true for time-independent Hamiltonians. dA by dt. Oh, sorry, for time-independent operators. Sorry, this, this equation is always true for time-independent Hamiltonians. If A has some explicit time-dependence, then there's a correction term. That's right. And, okay, so here's the, here's the question. What if the operator A that you're trying to study the time evolution of has some explicit time dependence? Well, you just add the same D partial A by partial T term up here in the Heisenberg equation. Okay, um, yes, thank you. Um, so why is this a useful uh, way of thinking about quantum dynamics? Well, often when you're introduced to Schrodinger's equation, it's some... Uh, new dynamical principle, uh, which uh, at first sight has no relationship whatsoever with classical physics. And it's a little hard to, in your minds, imagine going from classical physics to quantum mechanics, and it seems very, very uh, mysterious and strange. But here we see that there's an identical formulation of quantum mechanics, where we think about observables changing in time rather than states. And the equations of motion that you write down, then, are practically identical to the equations of motion in classical physics, with the only caveat that the Poisson bracket is replaced by the commutator. So I think this is an incredibly useful way of thinking about quantum dynamics, um, and it's a way that we will um, be using in the future. So um, I guess I should stop here, but we will continue on uh, Wednesday or whenever our next class is, um, with our discussion of quantum dynamics, where maybe I'll do path integrals. That would be exciting. Okay. Uh, see you on Wednesday.